welcome to the fourth of the uh, video lessons. This is the first one which is prepping us directly for an exam question. Um, and although it's looking at the background to the exam for a question, it's still very much uh, stuff relevant to that. So the first exam question is, why did Stalin come to power? Now, this is often described as the leadership struggle question as opposed to the come to power question. This is because on the death of Lenin, as we shall see in the next video lesson, um, various individuals are competing within the Communist Party bureaucracy and hierarchy for power. And that is very much a struggle as opposed to an election, a struggle as opposed to a coup. Because as mentioned in previous lessons, and as will be explored later, the way you win power is by votes. Votes win the party congress and the central committee particularly. And this is therefore not a democratic exercise, but a one of, of your ability to control and sway various patronage networks um, within the Communist Party. So before we start um, looking at the story, of um, the key individuals. We will be looking primarily at the um, uh, individuals involved and their personalities. And this is by no means all the leading um, communists who have power bases, have patronage networks, have groups of supporters lower down in the party who will be used to keep and sustain and grow power through voting the right way. However, these are the most important ones for the story and generally in the exams, the one you can get away with mentioning in this exam. <coughs> so what the focus here is, is not what they do, that is the next lesson, but who they are. Because often it'll make, help make sense of the decisions, the failures and the successes based on your understanding of who these people are. And at the start, there's often difficulty by the fact that these are just, to start with, Russian names uh, without any real personality. So the point of this is to give them the personality so you can understand them in more detail. This therefore will be a briefer and probably the briefest video lesson because it's much more about getting a sense rather than specific testable information. So the first individual is the eventual winner, and that is the name, and as you should hopefully know that because this course is called the Stalin course. That is Joseph Stalin, um, a name given to himself um, when he became revolutionary. Now Joseph Stalin will be the victor, but the most important thing you must understand about him is this, no one in 1924 would have predicted he would eventually be leader. Um, we'll look at his background in general in the specific, but essentially he was very much seen as a plodding, bureaucrat's grey blur someone who was always there but never really that helpful he was not taken seriously he was not considered a threat and that as we shall discuss is actually a whole paragraph or at least part of a paragraph on why did Stalin actually come to power um, mainly under his underestima underestimation so who is he he comes from Georgia. Georgia is a region, an ethnic region in the south of Russia. So although it's technically Russian, um, they speak a different language, they have different traditions, um, they are visually and racially different from other Russians, and therefore he um, very much is captures the outsider. Um, he is always self-conscious that amongst these very often urban middle-class Russians uh, from Moscow, Leningrad and beyond, um, he stands out as almost a country bumpkin, someone who's a little bit provincial, a little bit of an outsider, and that this will feed into the underestimation of him. And his background is doing bank robberies and various other criminal acts to help support the Communist Party. And through these brutal, um, often, and highly criminal actions, he eventually gets noticed by the uh, Bolshevik Party and increasingly becomes important by the sort of t 19 teens, as it were. Um, and his sort of basis of support is, is known as his industrious mediocrity, meaning he is not known for being particularly good, but he's known for working very hard. And he get, achieves results by just really ploughing on. And unlike, say, Hitler, genuinely working 14, 15, 16 hour days, complete, four, seven days a week to achieve an end. And this actually only builds into um, the image that he's not a threat. He's kept in um, uh, power, he's kept in the office. Um, because he's seen as a safe pair of hands who will do all the stuff and do it properly, not because he's right, but because he'll put hours and hours and hours into it. Um, and so therefore, his hard work is both a double blessing. If he was like Trotsky, very kept in power because he's good at something, and that good at something also makes him a potential for leader, he would be f far more threatening and people would sort of 
tend to judge him a little bit more and try and limit his power. But because he seemed good enough to be a leader, but not good enough to be a threat, he's able to get under the radar. Um, as well as this, he is absent for a lot of the key events. He's out of the country, for, I'm sorry, out of the town, um, uh, St. Petersburg, when um, the October Revolution happens. Um, for, for a large chunk of the important bits of the Civil War, he's doing various bits and bobs around more because he's been sent to less important fronts because people don't believe he's that important he's that good or that knows really what he's doing um and therefore he doesn't really have the heroic pedigree he, he didn't save anything he wasn't there he won't be any paintings he's very much a background marginal administrative figure so therefore overall because of this image of <coughs> industrious mediocrity this gray blur who does all the administration writes all the notes does all the um, paperwork but isn't an, a, a, a bright brain isn't a, a insider and isn't someone who is like at the cornerstone of the key events in communist history he is seen as a marginal fi figure and second rate his power comes from the fact that he volunteers himself cheerfully for any of the boring administration work um bureaucratic work that others did not want to do so we're talking about the filling out membership forms the organizing the minutes of meetings and minutes for those who are unaware are the record of who said what organizing the agendas sending out messages he's very much an administrator and that's looked down upon by many of the communists who are very much focused on um uh ideology and these communists who because they are all professional revolutionaries and haven't often haven't had a real job none of them are really good at um administration um and therefore they're happy to kind of let this sort of gray bureaucratic boring georgian um do it because they can't be bothered no one thinks they're giving him roles because he's powerful or because he's good <coughs> he's getting the roles which are stalin roles stalin work which are often not very very good roles um and they are happy to give it to him because although, yes, in theory, it gives some power, they don't really know how or why. They don't really appreciate how or why until it's too late. Um, they um, don't fundamentally don't see him as a threat. And this pair of hands is something that will abuse that because he's not capable enough. And so therefore, he's got numerous roles in the secretariat. And if you might remember from the last session, which we briefly mentioned, the secretariat is almost the administrative side of the party. In theory, because it's just about helping make stuff happen, pass paperwork, make sure orders get out, make sure orders come in, make sure um, discipline is kept, um, complaints are kept in power, proper appointment procedures are done, and all that sort of very boring stuff. Because of that, he ends up um, uh, having actually quite a lot of power, although technically the Secretariat isn't a very powerful role. And we'll look at that in due course as time goes on. He is also given, um, in the early years, although this is this is finished after the war, um, in the Sovnarkom, the role of Commissar for the Nationalities. Now, that will be very powerful. And it's important to realise that they gave this role to him because he's pretty much the only non-Russian in the senior communist ranks. Um, so therefore he becomes almost the spokesman for the minorities. And as you remember though from a first lesson hopefully, the Russian state is majority minority. The vast majority of people are not um, a Russian. So actually this gives him a, a huge amount of sway because essentially he's in charge of a large chunk of Russia. And as we shall see in a future lesson, he will use this effectively as a good political operator will to secure support in these areas. So essentially Joseph Stalin is this quiet figure that everyone underestimates who therefore is given senior roles. As we shall see however, he is a very very effective political operator ideologically in terms of his ideas his understanding of his communism and his ability to debate them he's quite weak but if you remember power is not about your ability to persuade people or your ability to convince the masses or be popular power is your ability to win votes he is very much very good at the background political political handshaking bribery blackmail promising promotion and so on to secure that backroom support and therefore although he is underestimated he will be highly effective in highly effective roles in the secretary of nationalities which means he can take advantage of this <coughs> and therefore secure power and this these will be our majority paragraphs the weakness of opposition undermining him uh, uh, underestimating him apologies um his roles which give him significant leverage and power and his ability to exploit those roles to their most potential so that's joseph stalin 
a quiet great blur underestimated by most but with the deep political skills able to cynically make friends change positions ideologically blackmail thieve bribe and use all means necessary to secure power he is a political street fighter he is a brawler and he this is something that the majority of leaders as we shall see are not suited to now our second leader is almost the polar opposite and there's no accident that he ends up becoming the chief rival leon trotsky as a post of Stalin who was seen as a non-entity, was seen by most as the potential heir of Lenin. Now, many who saw this were threatened by this because they didn't like him. However, Trotsky um, is an intellectual genius. He is uh, incredibly ideological, uh, a theorist second only to um, Lenin and potentially Bukharin, although he's probably slightly more um, intellect able, better able to debate than um uh, Bukharin, and a man who Lenin had particular respect for. Very talented, he won the war as Commissar for War through his combination of brutal um, uh, efficiency and discipline and terror combined with an ability to organise people, things and inspire people and things. Um, he has several negatives though. Despite his evident intellectualism and his talent and his respect by Lenin, he's often seen as arrogant, aloof, um, and um, disliked by the majority of the party. His Jewish roots were part of this, and this will be exploited by Stalin later, but mostly it was the fact that he really did not see himself as needing to make friends or try and um, be nice to people who were intellectually less than him, which was the majority of people. This is fine, maybe, in a democratic system where the, most people will never get to know you and they just judge you by your speeches. But in, a, in the a communist system, where to win power, you need to win votes in party congress and um, central committee, he basically is a spends his time alienating and upsetting and insulting the vast majority of people in that room. And so when it comes time to save him, no one's going to do it, apart from his very narrow circle. Now, his power lies in his role as commissar for war in the Civil War. This gives him respect. This gives him a public profile, as he is the person seen to win the war. But also, it means he's got a constituency. He has promoted and is friends with the majority of Red Army soldiers, um, and particularly senior officers, <coughs> who he knows well, having worked with them extensively during the war. These people are, on average, very loyal to him. And when it comes to Party Congress, they're the only people who really will vote for him and his agenda. They share a similar view viewpoint to him because he's picked them, and therefore they will be his base. The problem is they're not a big enough base. Now, because by the very reason he is the most competitive for leadership, the intellectual, like by Lenin, who's got a pedigree, commerce after war, who knows what he's doing, he is going to be ganged up against by everyone else. Um, and there are plenty of things, apart from his arrogance and aloofness, which help against his Jewish roots, part of it, and the fact he's seen as a bit too intellectual in a, in a Russian world where the majority of peasants and workers are uneducated. Actually, being intellectual can be a negative. Um, but also, he used to be a Menshevik. Um, and actually said some quite mean things about Lenin in the early 1900s before he moved over to the Bolsheviks quite late on. And so therefore, um, that will be used up against him as time goes forward. In addition, he has some sort of illness, which means at critical moments he is not involved in um, the politicking process. And there'll be a couple of key examples that, um, later on. <coughs> Most historians are um, argue, and there seems to be a broad consensus, that this is in part a psychosomatic disorder i.e his illness is a manifestation of some form of um psychological um either coping with stress or depression or something like that there's a huge variation of what that is but he is so consistently quote unquote ill with very vague symptoms at key moments at the apex of a real political struggle that will undermine him because he means he is not in a room shaking hands making friends gathering votes counting noses when he needs to on top of that he doesn't he doesn't really understand how power works he is very good at ideals and very good at understanding communism but he doesn't understand he doesn't sense that power comes in your ability to 
control power bases and make alliances. Because he's so intellectual, he doesn't see himself as almost above that sort of grubby power game. And that means he's very complacent. He doesn't make friends with the right people. He doesn't um, try and build up his power base. And he refuses to make alliances with other communists. And this means he, he's going to be very easy to isolate, marginalise, vote against and remove from the party, as he will be. So although he's very clever and very effective, he's not a political animal. He likes politics, he's very ideological, but he doesn't know how to win votes, which is a vital role of a politician. Okay, as uh, Lyndon B. Johnson um, said, you need to be able to count noses, count votes, and see who's, if you're going to win stuff or not. That is a vital part of this and will um, can be the reason why Joseph Stalin wins. Um, and finally, his political position is known as the left wing. He is very against NEP. He is very pro some form of war communism where the state has com almost complete control and is happy to use force to this end. He is very popular um, amongst the army, but actually very unpopular amongst the peasantry and some workers t as a result. Um, and therefore, he will take a left-wing anti-NEP position at any one point. That will be used against him, as we shall see. He is also pro-world revolution. This is the idea that um, he believes that the capitalist powers will try and attack, as they already have during the Civil War, communism because they see it as a threat to their own country. I, as long as Russia stays communist, the foreign powers will be worried um, that... Um, uh, are very worried that the to some extent um, the uh, working classes of say England will be inspired by the USSR and are more likely to revolt and so therefore he argues that they are as long as other countries remain capitalist Russia will always be at threat of invasion and therefore the priority of Russia should be in order to defend itself to export um, communism abroad that will be used against him as well okay and that's again the uh, international revolutionary idea uh, the next individual is probably the most of the group i wouldn't say likable but it's sort of innocent um relatively individual and this is lev kamenev he's been in a party for almost as long as lenin um and his very grandfatherly calm relatively mild consensus orientated personality means that he's relatively liked um, and although he's very traditionalist he's very much an old bolshevik who believes in the old bolshevik's ways and therefore this makes it means he's sort of suspicious of nep pro-world revolution and quite left-wing big you know state in order to transform socialism he's not necessarily ideological so while his gut says i want these i'm anti-nep he won't push it with, um, with much force compared to, say, Trotsky, who is much more ideologically against it. Almost his stomach says, uh, move against it, but his brain says, let's not be too hasty. So therefore, as a result of his popularity, but also the fact that he's a little bit of a doddering old man who doesn't isn't super ambitious or a massive threat, he's given quite important positions. <coughs> he's the boss of Moscow, uh, and with that, all the local um, party congress seats based on Moscow, are basically his to give out. Um, the party congress delegation, those who have been nominated from Moscow local parties, which then go to the, the um, party congress, almost all will always side with Kamenev because he is the boss in charge of the region. And in order to, to get the jobs and the patronage and the protection, um, they will give um, Kamenev their vote. Um, he is also therefore a Politburo member at the top, although not necessarily an effective one, who generally agreed with what Lenin did. He has some negatives, though. He disagreed with the October Revolution. He thought it was too um, too soon to be risking something like that. And this is used against him almost as evidence of his doddering, old man, sort of not taking any risks figure. And therefore, not many people take him seriously for real leadership or seriously as a threat. Um, this is only compounded by the fact that he doesn't really have much of a political instinct or a real inclination to try and make backroom deals or politic that widely his instinct is to sort of just be friends of everyone and to try and avoid controversy and this will only reinforce this image of this kindly old man who has been an old bolshevik and is probably a decent guy but not someone you really take seriously politically 
And this all combines, which means that he ends up as when Lenin is ill from his um, first and second strokes, he ends up being the um, uh, chairman of both the Solid Politburo and Sovnarkum, roles that Lenin himself have. This is, however, not evidence necessarily of how powerful he is, but almost for how weak he is. To be given these roles and everyone agree, people must not see you as a threat, although you wouldn't, or you wouldn't give power to someone. Um, particularly both roles to someone but Cameron never seen as a safe pair of hands who will try and make everyone friends and won't try and seize power for himself he won't be a Bonapartist to use the communist parlance after Napoleon Bonaparte who under uh, basically took over the French Revolution um, one one count one sort of complexity is, is either he is a brother-in-law of Trotsky although as we shall see that does not necessarily bind their relationship very closely so Kamenev is very much an older consensus politician but not very an effective one on the broad left but not very 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 ideological um who is seen as a safe pair of hands res uh, liked but not necessarily respected now his partner in crime and generally someone who almost inexplicably works very closely with but is almost the opposite in every way is zinoviev zinoviev is the real politician or wannabe i would say politician of the communist party he sees himself as a future le leader he is incredibly ambitious and but also complacent he essentially sees himself as a future leader better almost like a poor man's trotsky um, he is incredibly vain and unintelligent and not massively respected as a result for example during the civil war he spent most of his time in a comfortable leningrad uh, apartment he was not seen as a although he's been in the party for a long time he was not necessarily seen as um that effective or caring that much to get his hands dirty and he was seen there as quite distant from the average working class member and therefore because you have this very vain very shouty very arrogant very uh, ambitious person who doesn't have the ability to really push it through or the intelligence to push it through um, he's often resented by um, many in the party and this will be a massive um, problem for him because as mentioned before the way you win you get on the right side of the party line and not called a faction is you win the sympathy and votes of the majority of the central committee and party congress and he is disliked by so many communists because of his fundamentally flawed personality so he is his personality is one of is going to pl try and play the game and think he's playing the game but actually be a relatively second rate figure who's quite easy to manipulate and get around who doesn't in the end have much support and the support he does have is as much by his alliance with Kamenev to share their votes and share their supporters as much as anything else so <coughs> he um, is also um, uh, marked because he like Kamenev had opposed the October Revolution for a very similar reason and again this will be used against him as someone who shows he's a coward not necessarily particularly politically strong and almost a cardinal sin went against Lenin and particularly after Lenin dies this is going to be used very effectively by Stalin to isolate people so who is he he is a theory like Kamenev on the left now he is arguably less traditionalist by instinct he doesn't really believe in anything but he takes a left-wing belief because roughly that's where he thinks people are but he won't push it because he also doesn't believe it so he's ideological he will follow the ideas rather than his stomach but not because he believes the ideas but because he thinks they'll be useful for him to him politically and therefore while he will be left-wing he is perfectly happy saying nep is bad in order to um marginalize trotsky for example um, his power base is Petrograd, the uh, renamed St. Petersburg, so he's head of the party there, and thus the local party there, who appoint party congressmen, are under the control of Zonoviev, and the Comintern. The Comintern is the organisation that spreads international revolution. It makes friends and increasingly controls the communist parties across Europe and the wider world. It gives them money, in theory, although not that much, and it gives them lots of directions about what to do. That it definitely does, although not very successfully. And therefore, the party congress members from the Comintern and relatively young members who are inspired by the ideas of the Comintern uh, and World Revolution and the International Brotherhood of the Working Class and those um, cynics from Petrograd who want their, not make, to make their boss happy in order to keep their jobs and be protected and get further jobs um, are his base. <coughs> his role as head of the Comintern will come up to bite him. 
Um, and his position in the Politburo is not necessarily because he's good, but during the fights in the 1920s, which we mentioned briefly last time, where the workers' opposition try and split the party, um, he stayed loyal, and therefore Petrograd stayed loyal, to Lenin and Lenin to reward his loyalty gave him a seat at the Politburo though didn't necessarily respect him and not many people thought he was worth the job and so therefore what we have is an individual who is incredibly political but not very good at politics um, well positioned common term Petrograd Politburo but not necessarily respected as a result and definitely not able to make best use of this so we have someone who's going to try and play the game and will lose pretty quickly our last one is often called as the golden boy of communism, called by Lenin. Uh, this is Nikolai Bukharin. Now, Bukharin is the youngest um, of the party. And he is well-liked, well-popular. He's relatively relaxed. He's relatively respected. He's relatively nice. He's relatively friendly. And he's very good at making friends. Um, and he's seen as a brilliant line, even by Lenin, who praise him. However, his youth, although his relative youth, gets the better of him. He is seen as too young, too impulsive, too ununderstanding of the reality of the world, a little bit naive. Um, and that will count against him when people are, choose, are forced to choose between Stalin and Bukharin. <coughs> In addition, he will make relatively naive decisions, as we shall see, based on someone who's not politically experienced and he will come to regret them because they, they will end in his death uh, something to make we'll mention everyone here will be dead by 1940 apart from stalin um he is therefore relatively naive um uh relatively moderate and he's best known for being one of the defenders and architects of the nep he this is more because he is a moderate he believes the communist party needs to remain popular rather than rely on terror if it's going to exist in the long term and this makes him what quote unquote a right winger now this is obviously relative to the left wingers of the party who are anti-NEP and pro-government intervention but it, it shouldn't be that he loves NEP he just thinks it should exist for longer and there should be a slower transition to the dictatorship proletariat and a complete control of means of production um, this comes from his his unwillingness to antagonize the presence and his popular and his wish to make sure the communist party stays popular which is actually Compared to the average blood first, relatively blood first approach of all the others, and Lenin, if you remember, Lenin is perfectly happy to have priests killed and elites killed. This makes him a little bit of an outsider and also reinforces this image of a relatively nice but naive young man who just wants everyone to get along. Part of his problem is he is um, the uh, relatively almost popular amongst all but based amongst many he doesn't have a natural base of power he doesn't have an office he doesn't have a region he is in control on he's not the commissar of anything and therefore he doesn't have nominees whose jobs depend on him and he um and whose security depend on him who will then vote for him to keep that going his base of power is limited as a result so um the natural base of power um therefore is lacking and this will come to bite him as although he will have some supporters by his popularity in his pro NEP position particularly amongst the peasantry and the representatives of the peasantry whom Bukharin is the only one who basically says anything nice about NEP for and apart from Stalin um, he's not going to have a huge amount of support when he needs it in the party congress and particularly when people start forcing you to choose between him and Stalin Stalin being much better at the game so his only real background is he is the uh, Central Committee nominee. He is the representative of the Central Committee for the Moscow region. Um, this represents 37% of the whole population and 20% of the Bolshevik membership. So it means he is well known to a large chunk of the Communist Party in Russia because they, he, he is almost like their representative or one of their main representatives. But it will also mean that he doesn't have a way of getting patronage. Because as a nominee to the Central Committee, you don't have a way of giving jobs to people. If you are Kamenev and the party boss, there are loads of jobs you give to people. And in return, you make sure that those people vote the right way in the party um, congress. Or they tell their party congress member to vote the right way. Um, he will be well known and well liked across the public. But as mentioned, the way you win in the Communist Party is not by being good, not by being popular, but by winning the votes of the internal party battles he does not have that base so what we have 
is a nice man, well, relatively nice man, popular man, liked by many, bright mind, but fundamentally weakened by two major factors. His very politically exposed position of being seen as right wing. That is fine, but the moment that's seen as non-communist, he is in big trouble. Um, and he can be easily accused of being a capitalist, although he's not. And his lack of a base of support who will be able to defend him when things go wrong. So what we have amongst our lead, our leading men, although there's many, many more, these are the ones who really lead the way, are a number of people who are flawed in different ways. And if the system was different, say it was about elections or support of the elites or support of individuals, uh, or support of um, various individuals, um, then they would end up, um, someone else would end up winning. But because the Communist Party is decided entirely by internal votes, a man with the industrious mediocrity and political bureaucratic position of Stalin is inevitably going to win. Until the next video, I will see you later. <laughs>